Is liberty dying where you live? Escape to Keen at freekeen.com. Mr. Gordon. May it please the court, I'm Joshua Gordon. I represent the appellant, Richard Paul, who unfortunately can't be here this morning. First, I'd like to define what nullification is so that we have clarity of what we're talking about. There's lots of room for misunderstanding. There's some inadvertent uh, ideological overtones, and I think it has meant different things over the years. Um, so what it is not is it doesn't mean the jury determines the law. It doesn't mean that the law ceases to exist in the Cheshire County courtroom. Uh, it doesn't apply in civil cases. It doesn't apply outside the current case. It does not create precedent. And it's not very common because the defendant has to uh, admit the crime. Um, and because the legislature is able to create new defenses when it wishes, it's not the usurpation of the judicial branch by the legislature. What it is, is a jury can refuse to convict even when there is otherwise sufficient evidence without consequence. And it's merely a rule of lenity for the rare case when, uh, when the law does not create justice for a particularity of a particular person. Um, naturally, the state wants to construe the statute, which I've reproduced here, narrowly, uh, and says it merely codifies existing law and intended no change. But the state's, uh, the state's position is, is far too narrow. A portion of it says the jury system functions at its best when it is fully informed of the jury's prerogatives. Because fully informed has to mean something. And it means a lot because fully means all the way to the top or something like that. Could you, Mr. Mr. Gordon, could you explain what the trial court didn't do that you feel the court should have done? I'm looking at the language and it strikes me. The court did what was required under the legislation. I think it's what it did do. Uh, excuse me. What, what, it, what it did do too much. Um, in, if you read the jury instructions, and a uh, portion of them is reproduced in my brief at, at, at page 11, um, over and over it said, after the defendant gave his, uh, his, his nullification charge, and the state incidentally uh, said the same thing, um, the, the, the judge said a, uh, a number of things, seven or eight of them, that took back what the nullification instruction that the defendant gave. Among them was, if the lawyers state the law differently from the law as I explained to you, then you must follow my instructions and ignore the statements of the lawyers. So whatever the, the defendant proffered, the judge took back uh, moments later in, in the jury charge. And that's not the only one. He said this sort of thing over and over and over. If we accept that, doesn't that, doesn't that really uh, counter uh, your, what you said before, that the, that the, the uh, that this is not a sort of, uh, it doesn't sort of nullify the law? I mean, if the, uh, the, the, presumably the judge gave instructions on the credibility of witnesses. If one of the witnesses happened to be an African American, could the jurors have gone back and say, you know, I don't, I, I absolutely, uh, I, I despise African Americans and, and I'm not going to believe that person for anything. And the judge said it's perfectly legal for me to do that because I don't have to follow the law. Well, we don't know what goes inside the jury room, and presumably from time to time, those sorts of things, whether from uh, nefarious uh, sorts of um, impulses like that, or maybe more better ones, like, you know, uh, substance shouldn't be illegal, or the uh, best example, I, I suppose, is the Fugitive Slave Act. You could not get convictions uh, in our state, among others, um, in, in after the 1815 Act. And, and I, am I correct, Attorney Gordon, though, that did adjust what used to be a standard instruction that the standard used to be you must follow the laws I explain it regardless of any opinion you may have as to what the law ought to be the court actually changed that in this trial yes. and said you should follow the law as I explain it that in combination with the Wentworth charge which says you should convict if the evidence supports it. Isn't that sufficient to comply with the legislature's intent here? No, and the, the judge was accommodating in that, in that one statement, but it's not sufficient because it, um, as a, the jury instructions as a whole, under, undermined it. That's, that's one of the uh, instructions that the judge did modify. Uh, but the, um, 
But I, I think the, the larger point is that um, the, 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 um, the jury was, was not ever told, or, or the jury, the, the, jury the, the defendant's impulse or the defendant's instruction was undermined by the jury, every, by the judge every time. Well, it's, and it's, it's not suspicious. Isn't the, isn't the larger point, though, that it's more likely that the jury uh, received the proper instruction and what its rights are because the lawyer was allowed to argue RSA 519-23A? Isn't that more likely? The, the jurors pay attention. Well, the, 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 judge paid, the judge gave the defendant precisely the letter of the law. But what the judge did, what's insufficient here, is that the legislature, by doing this, undid that portion of Wentworth. It's not sufficient. By saying that the, the, the jury, excuse me, the legislature uh, has disagreed with the jurisprudence of this court. Where do, you find that, that, where do you find that disagreement? About halfway down the first big paragraph, it says the jury system functions at its best when it is fully informed of the jury's problems. And fully informed, it stands to reason, it does not believe that the current state of law is fully informed. Judge McCall, right? Pardon? Judge McCall, right? Uh, no, I don't think it's so a judge. I don't think it's a judge McCall. I think that's an, ex that's, a, that's an explanation of what's the matter with the current law in the legislature. But you would say then that the, jury, that the judge should not tell the jury they, that even that they should follow it, there should be no statement, even as Judge Congo pointed out, they shouldn't even be told you should follow the law. It's, it's what? I mean, why, why give any instructions at all then? It's, it's really up to the jury to just, you know, decide what the facts are and the law is. Why well, give it's up to the jury to decide what the facts are, and the jury should get instructed on what the law is, but the jury should not be told, do not, follow, you know, don't listen to the, the, the lawyers explain if they say something different. You may convict if you find sufficient evidence, but not should. Should is too strong a word. That's the Wentworth charge, and I, and I think this, this statute changes the Wentworth charge to something more permissive, like a may rather than a should. Well, Could you remind me, Mr. Gordon, because I don't recall the moment, did the charge include a pure so-called jury nullification instruction? In other words, if you find this fellow did this, but you don't think he should be convicted, that's okay? Did no, the judge refused to give it. It was requested by both the state and the defendant to give a nullification charge. But the interesting, the interesting thing is that the precise statute that you're relying on does not say, and the judge must instruct on nullification. I'm looking at it right now, and although it's preceded by the general court's intent, the actual instruction to trial courts is that defense must be, the defense must be permitted to inform the jury of its right. It doesn't say, and the trial judge must inform the jury. If we accept your position, we're reading words into the statute that the legislature didn't put there. And in fact, Mr. Gordon, just to follow up on that, the legislature had that language in front of it, correct? Right. And, and the court it. has to give that instruction and it rejects it. Isn't that significant no, for our consideration? I think the words fully informed do several things. One, it's a rule of construction, like the right to know statute, that the, that the what's in the preamble is a rule of construction that says you need to construe the statute in a, in a broad way. Um, and so it has four probable implications. One, the court, once the defendant has gives the, 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 the Request, the nullification request, uh, the appraisal. Um, the court has to get out of the defendant's way. It can't, the court they can't then undermine it. Because then you don't have a fully informed jury, you have a confusedly informed jury. What the, what the defendants just said, the court took back, and, 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 uh, and the jurors can say, oh, which is right, and the judge said, I'm supposed to listen to him, not the, not the, not the lawyer, so I guess the nullification doesn't exist. That's what we have here. Um, I, I think it also affects the Wentworth should must distinction. Um, I think probably, although we don't have the issue here, it makes nullification of defense so that you can put on your expert witness if you want. Uh, that undoes the, the uh, Hopkinson case um, where the medical marijuana expert wasn't allowed so to. They, so in other words, we, if, we, but if, if we accept that theory, doesn't that mean that basically trials are now turned into legislative committee hearings? The, 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 you know, if the issue is should marijuana be legal or not, 
You bring in all your experts to say, absolutely, marijuana should be legal. There's no, it's no more harmful than alcohol. And the state brings in its, and the, you know, this sort of uh, one day possession of marijuana trial or something is now goes on for, you know, what, two weeks or at least several days while we hear from all these experts? Well, obviously the judge has some discretion to bring things in. But no, the reason it doesn't turn courts into legislatures is because this is necessarily rare. It requires that the defendant admit the conduct and admit the intent. But it's, it's only rare because this is relatively new. If we, if we said this was okay, would it, really, would it really be rare in the future? I mean, I would suspect that there would be a lot of people who would say, you know, particularly if the evidence of the crime itself is pretty strong, hey, this, you know, I, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bet that I can get the jury to say the legislature was wrong in their choice of whether it's drugs or whatever the issue might be. It's just, it just seems unreasonable to me that a that someone charged with a serious crime of assault or something is going to say, yes, I did it. Please don't convict me. And that's just an untenable position on on you know prohibition or the future of the slave act or marijuana in our time. Maybe that might happen, but um, but uh, not in your general run of crimes. Well, I, remember, I remember rather vividly a uh, case when I was in the trial court involving an habitual offender statute where the defendant did just that. He said, yep, I did it, but please don't convict me because. So it does show up now and again. Right. And it happened with some frequency in, in the South, did it not? I mean, in the, in the 60s and 70s, I mean, you know, sure, I mean, this, the, the, this a white defendant murdered an African American, but absolutely. But you know, we have jury notification in New Hampshire, and the question here is, what does you know, how far does the statute go, and does it just require that this, that the judge allow the defendant to give the uh, the charge like, like he did here, or does it also allow the judge to then uh, countermand that very same charge that the that the that the Defendant just gave well, moments like before. What the trial court did here, it seems to me, was comply with 51923A, as you said it before, and didn't countermand it. It allowed the defense to inform the jury of its nullification right, which in fact happened. Your Honor, the, the judge really did countermand it. Look, look at the, the list on page 11 of my brief where I, where I bullet these things. The judge really did take away what the So what your, the argument is, is. your argument is when the legislature provides an overarching intent of a law and then, and then after it explains its overarching intent, it states the law, you say that we are allowed to read into the words of the law additional words um, that are gleaned from the intent, because that seems no. to me your, your argument. No, actually not. It's like Lanny in the, in the, in the right to know um, context, where, you know, here are the exceptions, but the, this court has construed, rightly in my mind, the right to know law in light of the purpose of the section of the statute. And that's what this is. This is a rule of construction. And so when the defendant gets his, his when the defendant puts forth the, the nullification charge, and the very next thing out of the judge's mouth moments later is, oh no, that's not true, or don't listen to him, that, that is undoes what, what the defendant So has. from your standpoint, the instructions to the jury should contain no recitation of the substantive law. Oh, absolutely not. No. All right, so where do we slice it? So you say the judge can tell the jury what the law is. He has to under Pearson. All right, okay. so you don't quibble with all of the instructions the judge gave in this case. Correct. You quibble with the occasions when the judge said, well, he did say you should follow the law and not you must follow the law. But then there were other times when he said, you take the law from me and not from the attorneys. You say, that needs to be wiped out of the, or modified. Of the normal instructions that are made. Modified in some, in some way so that it's not such a um, and in this In this trial, was the, were those specific requests made at the time? Some were and some weren't. Uh, the, so do we have to look at every occasion and see 
if there was a preserved objection? It's, it's not hard to figure out. The, 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 um, the trial attorney mentioned several of them. The judge changed one, but left, left the rest of them stand. And, 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 and Wentworth, for instance, the judge never addressed what was raised. And so that, that's why. And there are, but this court looks at jury instructions as a whole. And I think parsing them like this is probably too far. And in addition, the, the trial- I mean, parsing them like this is too far. That's what you're asking us to do, are you not? No, but you, have, but, but you take all these jury instructions as a whole, I think they undid what the defendant says. And in addition, the, um, the, the, the trial attorney asked the trial judge, do I have to stand up and object to each time I don't like what you say during instructions? And the judge says, no, I consider it preserved. So, you know, what was the trial attorney supposed to do in that case? You know, so I, I think it's preserved, and in, in the event that one or two are not preserved, the bulk of them are. May it please the court. I'm Nicholas Corder of the state. I'll take questions anytime. Doesn't Mr. Gordon have a point here? No. If the argument is what the argument was in this case, but the trial judge said basically, never mind, take it from me, not a problem? Not at all. I have to begin by apologizing to the court for my failure to thoroughly research the legislative history of this statute. Uh, if I had done so, I would have written a very different and probably much shorter brief. As it is, I ask the court to disregard everything in my brief that concedes, implies, or suggests that this is a jury nullification statute. It is not. Not only does this statute not require trial judges to give nullification instructions, it also does not require them to allow a defense counsel to argue nullification. We know this for certain because the original version of the bill that enacted the statute contained both requirements and both were deleted before the bill was passed. And the history clearly reveals that the bill would not have passed if they had not been deleted. So, so what you're saying is that 51923 a simply restates what juries do all the time. That is correct. Because yes. it says that uh, the defense shall inform the jury of its right to judge the facts. Judging facts is what juries have historically done. And the application of the law in relation to the facts and controversy. That is what juries historically do. So you say that calling this a nullification statute is simply a wrong characterization. It is simply, you say, a confirmation of what juries have historically done. That's absolutely right. Uh, if the court wishes, I'm ready to distribute copies of all the documents that I'm about to quote from. They're all uh, part of the record of the general court, if you wish. They will be taken from The bill was introduced in January 2011. HB 146 was entitled, quote, an act relative to the right of jury nullification, unquote. The first sentence of the preamble read as follows, quote, under the decisions of both the New Hampshire Supreme Court and the United States Supreme Court, the jury has an undeniable right to judge both the law and the facts in controversy. The bill would have enacted a new statute, RSA 51923A, whose text read in full, quote, In all court proceedings, the court shall instruct the jury of its inherent right to judge the law as well as the facts and to nullify any and all actions they find to be unjust. The court is mandated to permit the defendant or counsel for the defendant to explain this right of jury nullification to the jury, unquote. Roughly six weeks later, the bill was reported out of the House Judiciary Committee. The following is quoted from the official House record of February 23, 2011. HB 146, relative to the right of jury nullification, inexpedient to legislate. Representative Gregory M. Sorg for Judiciary. This bill would require judges in all court proceedings to, quoting from the bill, instruct the jury of its inherent right to judge the law and the facts and to nullify any and all actions they find to be unjust. End of quote from the bill. The committee concluded 
that as drafted, this bill would incorrectly instruct the jury to put the law on trial rather than the application of the law in the case actually before it. The committee further concluded that the so-called Wentworth instruction, by which the judge instructs the jury, that if it finds that the prosecution has proved all of the elements of the crime beyond a reasonable doubt, it should find the defendant guilty, adequately informs the jury of its unquestioned right of nullification without misleading it. Vote 15 to 0. End of quote. Less than a month later, the House amended the bill. It removed every single reference to nullification, including those in the preamble and the title. This version still required the judge to instruct the jury, but only on its right to judge the facts and the application of the law in relationship to the facts in controversy. Both in the preamble and in the statute, the jury no longer had the right to judge the law as well as the facts. The bill went nowhere in 2011, but it was carried over into the 2012 session, the second half of the biennium. When it finally was enacted in June 2012, only two real changes had been made from the amended version in March 2011. The preamble was shortened by removing a reference to the Seventh Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, and the statute no longer required the judge to give any instruction. It only says the court shall permit the defense in all criminal proceedings to inform the jury of its right to judge the facts and the application of the law in relation to the facts and controversy. It should have been clear already that a statute couched in these terms could have no connection to the jury nullification, which is not a prerogative of the jury. It's about the jury applying, it's not about the jury applying the law to the facts, it's about the jury ignoring the law, or as the original bill put it, judging the law, which in practice means judging the law to be wrong. But this history makes it even clearer. The statute as enacted says nothing about jury nullification because it originally did, and every one of those references was removed. Your point, your, point point is, your point is, I'm sorry to interrupt, I know you're on the roll. Your point is that the common law of jury nullification remains intact. Correct. And it would controvert every tenet of statutory construction for this court now to rewrite the statute. Let me just ask you this question. I mean, I make some very persuasive points, but I guess, what is, what is the purpose of this statute then? In other words, you're saying it doesn't change the law at all. So why did the legislature enact it? I mean, you're basically a sort of a soft to... I'm about to get to that. Okay. Because it looks like there's inconsistency between its statement of intent and actually what the operative law says. There are two questions that should be addressed. First, what did the Judiciary Committee mean when it used the phrase, it's unquestioned right of nullification? The court context makes it clear it was not giving that phrase the meaning this court would give it, since the same report categorically denied that the jury has the right to judge the law, and that's what jury nullification is. The committee was obviously talking about the power of nullification because it said the Wentworth instruction adequately informs the jury, and this court, which created the Wentworth instruction, has made it clear that that deals with the power of nullification. And, of course, the second question is a bit more problematic. If this statute isn't about nullification, what is it? The question can only be answered by viewing the statute in its political context. I don't think it's unreasonable to suggest that there are two reasons why legislators either vote for or sponsor in a given bill. Either they think it will benefit the people of the state, or they think it will benefit them politically. Clearly, there were a number of legislators who wanted to take credit for passing a jury nullification bill. As of February and March of 2011, every one of them knew that an actual nullification bill would never get through both branches or get signed by the governor. And it would have been very difficult at that time to say with a straight face that this statute was a nullification bill because the Judiciary Committee's report was right there, and so was the original version. But this bill wasn't passed until June 2012. The original bill and the Judiciary Committee report were 15 months old. In politics, memories can be very short, and appearance is often more important than reality. When the bill was passed, its supporters claimed that it was a jury nullification bill, and they continued to do so. They even convinced me for a few months. So the statute is not meaningless politically. Legally, it pretty much is. It just codifies a right that was implicit in the Wentworth Instruction. 
understood, if not expressly stated in the case law, right of the defense to tell the jury that it has a right to apply the law to the facts. The law being the law as explained by the judge. So what you would like us to do is to sort of end the end the solving, so to speak, of the of the uh, instincts of those who think jury nullification was really passed, and say that this law doesn't doesn't do what what at least some people thought that maybe it was going to do. Well, I can say this: this is the clearest legislative history I have ever seen. Now, the right of the jury to apply the law of the facts can be important. Uh, for instance, in a case where uh, the jury can acquit of the charge crime and convict of a lesser crime, if the evidence supports it. But there is no right of jury nullification. And this statute does nothing to change that. It's not a nullification statute. It is literally an excuse for the nullification statute. Well, there is a right of nullification. It belongs to the jury. There's a power of nullification. There is no right of nullification. I think you're quibbling over the Magna Carta. This that, that is a distinction that this court has drawn repeatedly. Uh, I am not making it up. Well, I'm so, not. <laughs> so, the power of nullification is the ability to nullify without consequence to the members of the jury. Sure. But there is no right of nullification. It is an illegal action. So well, it's also, I'm sorry. I'm when we talk about nullification, it's really a recognition of what juries can do, what they can do, as opposed to what they have a right to do. Exactly. And it's, and it's not quibbling. It, it's been, it, that distinction, you said, is very important. It was made by the court in the Pierce case uh, over 100 years ago. And it's really, it's a double jeopardy clause that, that, that basically comes into play. Once the jury says not guilty, whatever the reason, there's no appeal by the state. I've quoted some cases in my brief uh, that describe the anomaly of jury nullification and uh, point out that it's a, it's a consequence of several things, namely, as Your Honor points out, the, the fact that you cannot retry someone who's been acquitted, and the, uh, the various rights of the defendant to a jury trial. Um, and the fact that the jury cannot be punished for essentially violating their oath by uh, exercising their power of nullification uh, is the closest thing to a right that it is. Well, that's interesting that you mentioned the oath because no one's talked about that. Jurors take an oath to apply the law to the facts as they find them to be and to follow the that's correct. Right. Yeah, that's what the oath says. Yeah, as I, there's, there's at least one case in my brief that uh, quote says that jury nullification is against the law, but it is tolerated by the law. There's nothing further. Thank you. Thank you. Case submitted. We'd like to invite you to visit freekeen.com. Freekeen.com features audio, video, and blogs chronicling the transition to a voluntary society. Freekeen.com also has comments and discussion forums so you can be heard. Freekeen.com. I should be in Keene, New Hampshire with the Free Staters.